So this session, what we're doing is we're thinking about the different types of literature in the Bible, really uh, to say that there are different ways to preach, that uh, I want to encourage you to, to treat the Bible not as a set of information or as a source book for your theology, although it should give you your theology, uh, but I want you to treat the Bible as a uh, as an inspired document, an inspired record of what God wants communicated. And so he didn't just inspire the content, he also inspired the form that the content is written in. And so therefore, when we preach a story or when we preach a poem, we shouldn't sound as if we're just preaching an epistle, which tends to be the standard kind of style. And it's not because of epistles, it's because of uh, really Greco-Roman rhetoric that has come down uh, through the tradition to say to us, all speeches need to have this kind of introduction and they need to develop in this way. And, and so we can end up making everything sound the same. Okay, but actually God's given us a real diversity, a real, uh, every passage is unique, but there are different types of passage. And the, the way those passages work Actually, if we can tap into that, that will help us as preachers uh, or communicators to be able to, uh, to benefit and to have a head start on the actual preaching that we're going to do. So, for example, if we've got a story, a narrative, that gives us an awful lot of good things in terms of how we communicate it. And I've seen some people say, here's a Bible story. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the story. Let me just make some points. It's never worked in the history of humanity to just make some points from a story. What works is to tell the story, and in doing so, make the point of the story. You see, so God's given us a gift. He didn't just give us a list of uh, 1,189 chapters full of lists of commands. He's given us narratives and poetry and discourse and all the different genres and styles and different writers with different vocabulary. And all of those differences are a gift that enables us, hopefully, to preach. If we can reflect that, to preach with creativity, to preach with difference, diversity, uh, making it interesting for our listeners. Okay, so uh, the three uh, kinds, the three broad types of literature, I, I've not given you probably many blanks to fill in, but this is one of them. The three broad types. This, is, this isn't even genre. There's probably six or seven genre in the Bible, but this is above genre. And I'm just going to call it types. Okay, The three broad types are narrative, which means story, either history being recounted or a story being told. Okay, It works the same way. Uh, so a parable is narrative. So narrative is one, and that's the most common. We've got more of that than anything else. Then the next most common type is poetry. And there's a lot of poetry in the Bible. Obviously, there's Psalms, there's wisdom books. There are songs in various places. The Song of Moses, Song of Miriam, uh, Hannah's prayer is poetic, things like that. But there's also the prophets. The vast majority of the uh, writing prophets write in poetry because it's very punchy. It communicates very strong images very quickly. And so the, po the prophets communicated that way. And so we've got narrative, and then we've got poetry, and then the smallest type is what I would call discourse, which means direct communication. So think of epistles, their discourse unless they're quoting a hymn, then it becomes poetry for a while. But typically, an epistle is me to you telling you something, you know, so it's discourse. Or a speech. Think of uh, Joshua, at the end of Joshua, when he's speaking to the nation, he's got a, an address for the nation. Uh, that's discourse. Okay, so these are the three broad types. And what we're going to attempt to do in this session is, is introduce each of them with just some of the, the most important features of each and the differences that come from that. And I'm even going to try to help you see how that works in three passages. Okay, so if you're, if you're struggling, you're like, oh, this is a lot of information. There's more wine gums. We'll get through this. Okay, we can make this work. So 
Remember that the form is inspired. I think that just having that conviction in our hearts, in our minds, God didn't just want David to say this. God inspired David to write this as a poem. Okay, the, the form of the writing is inspired, and therefore we have a huge help. So let's go with narrative first. Stories. How do stories work? We do live in a time where people think that somehow stories are not very sophisticated, right? Stories are for children. But us adults, we don't need stories. That's nonsense. Most people in most of the world for most of history have lived in story world, telling stories back and forth, passing on traditions, passing on values by telling stories. Uh, it's normal in tribal cultures for everything to be about story and being a part of the story and re repeating and retelling the story. But actually, even in our world, Western Europe and North America, kind of the modern West, what's happening is everything's moving back towards stories. And so movies are huge, TV shows are huge, uh, people are influencing through movies politically. The most politically influential people in the world are probably in Hollywood rather than in Washington or Brussels or wherever. There's a massive influence because they know that stories move people and change people and shape the way people think. Advertising has moved from, uh, in a lot of cases, from 30 years ago where you'd have the scientist in his white coat explaining that in an experiment, this washing powder produces better results than the others. Nowadays, you get a glimpse of a story, just a snapshot of somebody looking happy while their child falls into the mud and gets dirty clothes or something. Okay, so story is really becoming pervasive in our culture and um, sports events. It's never, it, this is slightly different, I think. Well, no, it's not. Even in America, where they obsess with statistics when they do sports, it's all about the numbers. It's not, because when the game begins, the commentators create story. This is the first time this guy has played against his old team. What's going to happen? Who's going to come out on top? And it's always story. That's what grips us. And so how do stories work? They, they grab a hold of us so that we want to know what happens. Right? If, you, if you listen uh, purely to a set of uh, statements, it doesn't really matter whether there's seven statements, ten statements, or twenty statements. You listen, if they're interesting, you take them, but it, it has to be pretty good for you to care about hearing the whole list. But you hear the start of a story, you want to know what happens. Right? Stories grab hold of us. So the basic elements of a story are the, the setting, where is it, what's going on, the, the narrator, the person telling the story. But really, just to be really simple and, and keep things focused, as far as I'm concerned, stories are about characters in a plot. Always. Characters in a plot. Okay, so the characters are the people, and the people in stories will do one of two things for us. Primarily, they will either attract us or repel us. We'll either identify with them or we will disassociate from them. All right? you, may, you may have noticed that when you're watching a film, you like certain people, you don't like other people. In the old days, it was always really clear. Nowadays, they tend to make it more mixed, more real, that everybody's got both good and bad rather than just the good people and the bad people. But even so, you'll find yourself liking someone that's predominantly bad because there's, there's something about them that, that is attractive or compelling. And so characters are not just out there, they are, they are there for you to connect with in some way, and then they get into a situation where there's a problem. That's the nature of a plot. Okay, a plot is, is a situation unresolved. Something happened. What happened? How are we going to resolve it? And so the moment the story starts, the effect is that you want to know what happens. So think about that before we get to the Bible. Think about that in terms of TV shows. Okay, in the old days, you watch an old movie, the movie begins and the credits roll, right, for 10 minutes. 
They just keep going, starring this person and this person. You know, and, and this could go on for ages because in those days, going to the cinema was a huge event. And you'd go and you'd pay your money and just being there was exciting. But nowadays on TV, you have 1,000 different options at the same time. And so they don't start with the credits, they start with the story. And then six minutes in, this is the name of the show. And then you carry on because they can't afford to let you go looking at other things in case something else grabs you. They want viewing figures. So the TV show begins and instantly uh, there is characters and very quickly there's a problem. There's a situation. So if you look at the, uh, the plot line, I put on page two, it's this line that uh, starts kind of at the bottom and then starts going upwards and then it comes down again. That's a, a plot line and that's what we have with any story. You begin at number one with the situation, the setting. Okay, so you've got, uh, let me put this into TV show terms, just for something easy. You've got the woman driving home with the groceries in the back of the car and she pulls into the driveway. It's not very interesting yet, okay? You might like her driveway, you might think that's a lovely home, but you're not gonna stay watching for that. And so they've gotta to get to number two, the tension. What's the tension here? She walks into the house and drops her bags because she sees something. You know, she sees her husband uh, dead, probably, right, most TV shows. So he's been killed and uh, the bag drops Oh, next thing you know, all the detectives are arriving and the police are putting the ribbon around the outside. And, and now they've got you because you want to know what happened. You don't know the woman. You know it's, it's being acted. You know it's fake. You know it's going to be resolved. You know, you know all these things about it, but your heart is, I wonder what happened. I wonder what happened. And so the detectives start asking questions. And, and it's a weird thing about TV. We think when we're watching it that we can figure it out. Don't you do that? Oh, I know, I know who did that. I want to know who did that. I'm going to work out who did that. But actually, if you stop and think about it, you cannot know who did that until 10 to, 10 to 10. It's now 9.03. They're not going to tell you and resolve it, and that, that's it. That was a good day work, you know, in 10 minutes. There's going to be an increase of complexity in that problem. And so let's say that the husband is, um, is lying on the floor and he has been, um, I don't know, strangled with a telephone cord, right? And his estranged son works for the telephone company and they had an argument last week. So you think, got it, it's the son. Oh, it's not the son, it can't be the son because it's 9, 9.03, it's too early. It's just starting you thinking something, but then in, a, in the, preceding story, you'll discover that the son's got an alibi and it wasn't him anyway, and the story develops and, and eventually somewhere along the line, some character is off to the side so that you've technically seen them, and eventually it turns out that they're the character and then the problem gets resolved. They get arrested, things get solved, and then the, the final bit, number five there, after the resolution, you have the, the, well, after the tension is resolved, you have the denouement, the kind of tying together of loose ends. That's not going to take too long. You know, it might just be the detectives or the police officers putting their clothes, their uniform back in the locker and leaving. That's the end of the show. But that's a plot line that has grabbed a hold of you and has made you want to know what happens. And it's made you wonder uh, about the poor wife and who, who's to blame, and, and who should I be happy about, and who should I be angry with, and, and all of that emotion that goes into that, they know that works, and so they produce thousands of these TV shows, right? And they can be the same every single week, and we keep watching, because stories grab a hold of us. And now once you understand that about the, essentially, the story is number two to number four, one is important and five is important, but really numbers two and four on the plot line are the issue. You'll start to look at Bible stories and say, oh, I wonder how this is working. What's the tension here and how is it going to get resolved? And the beauty of that is that it's within that 
resolution of the tension that you're going to discover the main idea of the passage. Okay, so you see that this is actually gold for preachers to be able to understand what is going on in a Bible passage. And so when you're looking at a Bible story, you want to look for that plot and look for how the characters are portrayed. And often in the Bible, you're blessed with very succinct storytelling. If you think about it, you go to um, an airport and go into the bookstore and buy whatever the, the fiction books are that they're selling. I wouldn't do it personally, but you know, if you're into that kind of thing, you buy fiction today and you'll get three, 400 pages to tell one story. And it will be page after page after page of description. You know, the, the woman was sat at the bar when suddenly this man walked in through the door. He was wearing and he stood this tall and he looked like he obviously worked with his hands and, and looked after himself, but his hair and his belt and his jeans and, and you know, all this detail just to kind of, oh, I, I don't know, fill pages or whatever. That's how stories tend to be written today. And then you come to the Bible and you get a story, boom, just in a few sentences. But it still does the same thing. So look at the story of Zacchaeus, Luke 19, just as a case study for us. Luke 19, you can look it up in your Bible or you can look at the notes. <coughs> Funnily enough, it's the same thing. Luke 19, 1 to 10. And I want you to, to help me out a little bit here. I'll read it, but I want you to help me to find the plot. Okay, we need to figure out what the plot is here. So the first thing we're going to look for is the setting. And really what we're looking for is where does the setting start to become a tension? Where is there some kind of uncertainty emerging within this story? So, so I'll read, and when you think uncertainty is starting to enter in, or something that's creating some kind of tension or conflict, make a noise. All right, whatever your national noise of choice is, make that noise and, and we'll see if, if we all agree. Okay, so starting at verse 1, he is referring to Jesus. So Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Still setting? Yeah, it's not fascinating, is it? I mean, it's, it's interesting because it's Jesus, and of course we love everything that Jesus does. But, so, okay, so he went through Jericho. Um, what else? And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. What, what, what? Is that a noise? Why is that? Right, so the original hearers or observers of this event, the moment Zacchaeus is in the story, there's a, uh, don't like tax collectors. All right, so there's a tax collector there. What are we told about him? He's a chief tax collector and he was rich. That just, doesn't that just add to the character? Okay, this is, sorry? Filthy rich. Mm, filthy rich, that's right. He's, he's taken money, protected by the Romans, money for himself as he's collected taxes. As a chief tax collector, it means that he has probably taken some of the money that other tax collectors have taken, so he's benefited twice. And nobody likes people on that kind of payment system, right? And, and he's rich. Obviously he's rich. He's taken a lot of it. So that's adding a lot of detail. It could just say tax collector. But the chief and the rich is really making sure we don't miss. This is significant. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. So we've got Jesus passing through, but we've got Zacchaeus, who's a negative, and he wants to see Jesus. So suddenly these two, how these two characters come together is a question. How's that gonna work? We already see Jesus very positively. You know, we, we know something about Jesus by the time we get to Luke 19. Ooh, how's this gonna play out? Okay, so uh, let's see. But on account of the crowd, there's another bit of setting information, Zacchaeus could not see who Jesus was because he was small in stature. 
Now, if you're short and you, you, know, you get offended by references to height, that might create tension for you, but um, don't let me compound that by my own height. But, but it, it's an important information piece because there's a crowd and he can't see over it, so he, he's got a problem. He wants to see Jesus, but he can't. So what's he going to do? What would you do? See, uh, when we're reading stories, we want to slow down enough to try to image it, imagine it. And then when we preach stories, by the way, one thing I find really helpful is, is to realize that my listeners have like a screen like this in their hearts. And that screen is empty. It's blank. And if I just speak really fast and, and just press on through, the screen stays blank. But if I start to describe in a way that's effective what's going on in the story, gradually the, the listeners start to see the movie on that screen. And once they start to see the movie, then all the effects of story start to kick in. They identify, they pull away, they feel the tension, they wonder what's going to happen. And there's an emotional grip that comes from imagining the story. Now, if I'm going to be able to do that for others, if I'm going to be able to describe so they can see it, I have to see it myself. So notice as I'm talking about it, I'm already saying, okay, there's a crowd and he wants to see Jesus, but he can't because of the crowd. What's he going to do? Okay, that's, that's part of feeling and imagining the story. Okay, so we've got up to the end of verse 3, we've got a tension. We could even say that we've got a tension that's starting to get more complex. Do you think? Because the tension is tax collector wants to see Jesus. Okay, so he saw Jesus. That's a terrible story. You know, Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. And he did. Moving on, next story. Those are terrible. The Bible doesn't waste time with non-stories, okay? He wanted to see Jesus, tension. So how does it progress? There's a crowd and he can't see because he's short. More tension. And then is there going to be more? What do you think? Let me read, you tell me. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. He's, he's acting like a child, yeah? But he's a man. And he's a man, and, and this is where we have to be thinking, okay, not just the details of the story, but the cultural setting of it. Do men run? Do men climb trees in the Middle East? They might in your culture, but not so much. There's a dignity about men. Boys will do that. Men don't do that. Men wear long robes. Robes make running awkward. They make climbing really awkward. Because you have to hoist them up, you know, and share, share your legs with the world. This, is, this means nothing to us uh, if we're used to, you know, some of our cultures. You know, the, the sun comes out and you take your clothes off because, you know, you want to get some sunshine. We don't feel that tension of the shame and the dignity and, you know, uh, Mediterranean, a lot of Mediterranean cultures live beside the swimming pool, completely comfortable wearing nothing but, you know, something very small. That's not the Middle East. Middle East, mm -mm. I'm dignified. I am not going to run. I don't care if there's a fire all around me. I will walk out of my fire, <laughs> you know. And so there's, a, there's a, a cultural thing happening there, but Zacchaeus runs and he climbs. Yeah, which means? Yeah, okay, so he's, he's got a position, even if it's a hated position, he's a higher up person, a boss. So yeah, it's worse. Yeah, he's got a political power, influence, that kind of thing. But also, what does it mean that he's hated, and how does that play into it? Because the normal people don't go, ah, you're a chief tax collector, yes sir. They hate him, right? Hate him with a passion because he is getting rich. Filthy, filthy, filthy rich. And it's at their expense. 
and they can't do anything about it because every time they start to complain, the Roman soldiers who are standing by put their spears in the chest and say, are you going to pay or not? They are avoiding giving to Jesus. Right? If you're Zacchaeus, let's put it a different way. If you're a child and you want to see past a crowd, what do you do? You go through the crowd, right? My children will cut through a crowd to get to the front to see the, the thing that's passing. What would happen to Zacchaeus if he tried to pass through the crowd? This? This, <laughs> yeah. A bit of rugby, you know, a little bit of karate. Or even a little bit of a knife. Because in a crowd, you're safe, right? You can't get caught. Roman soldiers are watching, going, hey, where'd he go, where'd he go? And in the crowd, you've got your little knife because you're a fruit, fruit farmer. So a little knife with quite the blade on it. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, Zacchaeus wouldn't walk through that crowd under any circumstances because it would probably cost him his life or at least a beating. All right, it's just not something you do. And so the running and the climbing makes sense if he's desperate to see Jesus, but there's no way he's going to risk pushing through the crowd. So what does that tell us about Zacchaeus in the tree? If he's wearing a robe and he's up in a tree and the crowd hate him, what's he going to be doing in the tree? Hiding. Right? He's not going to be balancing on the tree like in the children's Bible story books like this. Jesus, I'm in a tree. Woo! You know, he's not Mr. Happy hanging out of a tree like an eight-year-old boy. Look, hey, look at me, look at me. He's hiding in the tree. There's no way he wants to be seen. Okay, so, so it's creating a, a tense situation. What's going to happen? And you kind of know with stories that it's not going to finish like this. And so Jesus passed by and he saw him. And once the crowds left, he climbed down from the tree and went home. That's not interesting. No one would take the time to write that story. So it feels like we're getting towards a point of what's going to happen, right? So where are we? Verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus. Let's pause there. And he, does that matter? What, what, what's going on there? Sorry? He knows his name. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, what happens in a crowd if you look up? Yeah, try it in the main hall sometime. Not during a session, that would be distracting and I'll get in trouble. But, you know, when you're walking in, go, oh, and watch. Everyone else will go, oh, what was that? All right, so he's drawing attention to Zacchaeus. Yeah. And so put your... Exactly. Put yourself in Zacchaeus' sandals. You're hiding out in the tree. Your heart's pumping because you just climbed up in the tree and hope nobody saw you. And there's a crowd of people who will hate you and want to rip you apart. And now Jesus has stopped. Oh, no. And he's looked up. Oh, no. And he shouted out his name. Oh, my. Zacchaeus is not in a celebration at this point, right? He's not like, whoa, it's my lucky day. He is panicking. Right? We've got to engage our our emotions, feel what he's feeling at this point. All right, there's a real tension there. I'm done for, I'm in trouble. Put yourself in the sandals of the crowd. What do the crowd think at this point? They're laughing, Zacchaeus is in a tree, I've got to see this. And what else? They might have been worried Jesus is gonna give him what he deserves. Right. Tell him he's Simple. Yeah. Give him a talking to. Yeah, yeah so they're going to. Jesus, of course, is the guest of honor, although he hasn't been anyone's guest because he's passing through. But, but they're going to let him talk. He's initiated. But what are they kind of hoping for? Jesus will give him a hard time, and then we can mock him. Then we can have a go. Then we can, we can pull him apart. I mean, it's, you, have you ever been around a crowd that? that starts with laughter and mocking, but gets angry or gets vicious, it's frightening. When a mob is formed, you know, outside a football ground, you find yourself wearing the wrong colors in the wrong place, and suddenly there's a few thousand people from the other side, you, you can really feel your heart starting to beat fast, right? 
Like, I'm really in trouble. No eye contact, uh, slip away, get away from this, because if you go, hey, ooh, they're going to go after you. You know, you've really got to be careful when there's a mob. E even if every one of those people are generally reasonable, put them together, not a good idea. All right, you don't want to go to a Roma game wearing the wrong colors, right? You don't want to go to a Juventus game or to a Barcelona game or whatever. You've got to be careful because mob power is huge. And now there's a mob gathering around the tree, which means that the Roman bodyguards are probably not able to get close. So they've got a chance here. So you see how this, this story has gone from just being a nice little Jesus wandering through Jericho to a real tension. And the more we talk about it, the more you start to feel the tension, even though you know what happens. Never think that just because people have heard a Bible story before, they don't need to hear it again. Let them feel it. Just like children will have the same story every single night because they really want to experience that same feeling again. And actually, adults will watch the same movie two or three times because we enjoy it too. In the same way, our churches may need to hear Bible stories they've heard before and benefit still. Okay, so where does this tension get resolved? Let me just read the next bit. And uh, you tell me, where does the tension of Zacchaeus and Jesus connecting get resolved? Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. There's a big chunk for us. Where's the resolution to the problem? Let's put it this way. Does the problem get resolved at the tree or in the house? Because in, in verse 8, it's a house. In the house? Anyone, anyone else want to vote? So the, the resolution begins at the tree. Ultimately, the story flips to the house to kind of show us the outcome of that, to, to reinforce the fact that the problem has been solved. Now, I think it's important theologically that we think about this, because if we put the resolution completely in the house, what are we saying? Zacchaeus gets saved because he gives money away, as if it's his initiative, right? And of course, we all believe that, don't we? That we get saved based on our initiative when we choose to do the right thing. Oh, no, wait, that's not Christianity. Yeah, Jesus takes the initiative, and Zacchaeus... Hurry and come down, for I must come to your house today. What, what's the significance of that? I must stay at your house today. In England, that would be rude. Oh, hey, I'm coming to stay with you on the week, you know. We fly home Thursday, I can stay at your house, right, Thursday night? That would be awkward. I would, uh, to, to do that in, in English world for hospitality, I'd have to ask indirectly and say, you know what, I've got a bit of a problem. I wonder if you can help me. Do you know anyone that might be able to give me accommodation on Thursday evening? You know, and actually what I'm saying is, I want to stay with you. You seem nice. You've probably got a nice house, you know. Maybe your wife can cook. Yeah. But, but I don't, in English world, I cannot say direct because it's rude. So is Jesus being rude? The clue is, is Jesus English? No. All right, so he's not being rude. So what's he saying? How can we put that in different terms? I want to be your friend. I want to be your friend? Yeah. He's honoring him. It's not, it's not just making a request. He's honoring him with what? His presence where? At the table. The ultimate image of fellowship is we must eat bread together. Really? And think about the fact that Jesus is passing through Jericho and he's probably getting all sorts of offers from the mayor and from the you know, synagogue ruler. And, you know, my wife cooks the finest falafel, Jesus. Please come and be with us. Now I'm passing through. Oh, and maybe that's been going on all the way through. And then he goes, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. Whew. What an honor to have fellowship at the table with Jesus. There's nothing rude about it at all. It's an intense honor, and Jesus has initiated it. Zacchaeus gets down quickly and goes with Jesus. Verse 7, 
Does it matter? Yeah, absolutely. Nobody would eat with a tax collector. They, they hate the man. Jesus is saying, I value you enough to, to eat with you. And I'm not afraid for anyone to know it. I'm not sneaking around. I'm telling the world, I'm going to come and eat with you. I'm, you're my host. You know, so there's, there's all of that redeemingness, redemption socially. But does it work? Do people go, oh, well, in that case, Zacchaeus is a good guy. You see, verse 7 matters. And we're tempted when we read through stories to skip details. But verse 7 is important. What happens in verse 7? Yeah, who are they grumbling at? They're grumbling. A sinner. Yeah. Right, so he's honoring someone that shouldn't be honored. He's picking the wrong company. And instead of being angry at Zacchaeus, which is what they have been by default, they're now angry at Jesus. Which, if you imagine the story, how do you think Zacchaeus came out of the tree? I don't think he came down like this. <laughs> Because that crowd is still pretty scary. I think he came down quickly, like it says, and probably ushered Jesus away very quickly. Okay, I don't know what you're doing. Let's go, quick. Come on, let's go, let's go. Let's get out of here. Because the tension of the crowd is growing. That word grumbling is a, a kind of growing anger, like a crowd that's going from mockery into anger. It can, it can rise really quickly. But that anger is now at Jesus instead of Zacchaeus. That verse 7 is really important in understanding the resolution of the story because what's happened is Jesus has initiated with Zacchaeus, but he's also redirected anger away from Zacchaeus onto himself in order to set Zacchaeus free. It's an incredible picture of the gospel right there. All right, and if we skip that and say that Zacchaeus gets saved because he gives his money away, we're corrupting the gospel and turning it into Islam. Right, where it's down to us to be good enough, or some other religion. It's not. In, in this case, Jesus is initiating, and he's taking anger on himself, and he's releasing someone from anger they deserve. As a preacher, if we're not careful, we will look at verse 7, and we will say, the crowd grumbled. We shouldn't grumble. The Israelites grumbled. They shouldn't have grumbled. Please don't grumble. Moving on. And we can make a moral point from what seems like an incidental detail and completely miss the point of the story. Every detail is helping this story make sense. All right, the crowd grumbling is not a comment on crowds grumbling. It's a comment on what Jesus is doing. Do you, do you see my point? You've got to be careful that the story holds together as one, not lots of different things that we can make our little preaching about. You know, you might have a church full of people grumbling. <laughs> if you're in church leadership, you probably know who they are and what they're saying. Preach this, I would not talk to them about their grumbling. That is not the point here. Preach something else if you want to deal with that issue. Although actually this may deal with that issue by lifting their eyes to Jesus, which tends to help in terms of solving things. But don't just take a word or a detail as an opportunity to go for something when that's not what it is referring to here. Okay, so the crowd's grumbling at Jesus. Jesus has set Zacchaeus free. They've left. Was Zacchaeus simply accepting an escape from a, a tricky situation, or has he genuinely connected with Jesus now? Verse 8. There we see the genuine connection is already in place, right? And so this is the completion of that resolution because he's giving stuff away. That is pretty much the evidence of a transformed tax collector, right? Tax collectors grab and keep. They don't give away like he does here. And so Jesus has shown incredible, amazing grace, and the natural response to that is a extravagant grace, right, from Zacchaeus. Tension is resolved. We're not wondering, are Zacchaeus and Jesus gonna connect? Is he gonna see Jesus? Are they going to get on? Is Zacchaeus going to get saved? All of that is getting resolved. And so verse 9, just to underline, make sure that we know that. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. Wow. There you go. Bow is tied. The story is finished. 
the story of Zacchaeus, the seeker, who would go to extreme lengths to seek and to see Jesus. He would run. Middle Eastern men don't do that. He would climb. Middle Eastern men don't do that. But what a guy. He got to see Jesus. That's the end of the story. Or is it? What's verse 10 got to do with it? Yeah, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Really? I thought he was just passing through. Do you see how the story has has done a little twist for us at the end? It set us up all the way through to, to say, this is a story about a seeker named Zacchaeus. Here's the story of the seeker named Zacchaeus. He was a seeker. He wanted to seek and see Jesus. He couldn't see him because of the crowd, so he found another way to see him. He ran because he wanted to see him. He climbed because he wanted to see him. And then Jesus came along and he saw him. In a sense, that's what the story's doing, is it's putting all of the focus on Zacchaeus until the resolution comes in the form of Jesus. And then when you get to the end, you discover actually who was coming to seek who that day? Jesus was the one doing the seeking. Now, I'm sorry, I can't come for your wife's falafel. I'm sure it's lovely. I've, I need, I've got someone I need to see. Jesus was on a mission. He was going to get Zacchaeus. And that, that's the way stories tend to work. You get a, a tension that builds and then resolves, and then suddenly there's a turn, and you go, I never saw that. But actually the whole story was about that. And so there's, there's intricacy, there's complexity, there's beauty, and there's theology all the way through these stories. And so as you study it, by looking at the plot, especially where does the tension create and how does it resolve, you can figure out what the story is about and then you can preach it by telling that story and making the point. And that's going to be a very different sermon than a sermon based on an epistle where you have points. Do you see what I mean? And so if I'm preaching this passage in a sermon... I'm going to set it up to do what this passage does. So what I'll typically do uh, with Zacchaeus is I'll start with something like, um, what I've used is, is a reference to a movie. You know, one, there's different kinds of movies, but one of the most popular is the, is the type of movie called an epic quest. That is where, where there's a journey to be made and a destination to be reached. The Lord of the Rings is a very epic quest. Uh, Wizard of Oz is an epic quest. Uh, one of the epic quest type movies was Saving Private Ryan. I'll just give a little bit of the story of Saving Private Ryan, of these soldiers going in to rescue uh, this young man. And then at the other end of, uh, of that story, the uh, person who's rescued him is injured and is dying. And he says to the young man that he's rescued, now earn this. And then Hollywood magic brings us forward 50 years and the young man is now an old man standing at the grave of the man who rescued him. And with his wife or daughter, whoever it is next to him, he says, tell me I've lived a good life. Tell me that I'm a good man because he's lived under that pressure his whole life. And so I use that because it actually fits really nicely with this because I'll say, you know what? That's an amazing story. That is an epic quest That the seeking that they did was was absolutely astonishing what they went through in order to achieve their goal. Let me tell you the story of the greatest seeker. The story of, let me tell you the story of Zacchaeus. Now I've not lied, but I've made people think I'm talking about Zacchaeus by the way I've introduced it. And then I work my way through the story, helping people to imagine it all the way through, making Zacchaeus the focus discovering that actually it's Jesus that transforms him, not in the house by Zacchaeus' commitment, but at the tree by Jesus' grace, honoring him, turning anger away from him, and then ultimately saying, oh, by the way, the greatest seeker is not Zacchaeus, it's Jesus. He's the one that did the great journey, not just through Jericho to get to Zacchaeus, but from heaven to get to this earth and ultimately to go to another tree. And I'll just go to the cross because I think this is setting that up. Jesus went to another tree and he sets us free by turning anger that we deserve away from us and onto himself. Not the anger of the crowd, but the anger of his father. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And the reality of that good news means that you don't have to earn this. You don't have to be a good man. The truth is you're not a good man or a good woman, and nor am I. 
and we could never earn it, but the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so I'm, I'm putting a, another story at the beginning and the end just to help clarify the gospel part of it, but really I'm just telling the story. And so I can, I can preach that in 10 minutes. I just did it in three. I could do it in you know, 30. I could probably go 40 if I needed to with this story and, and stretch it out a bit more. But basically, no matter what length I've got, I'm telling the story. And when I preach that, people tend to go, because they're gripped, not by me, but by the story. Now compare that with if I unstoried it. In Luke chapter 19, we have a 10 verse section which tells us in conclusion that Jesus is the great seeker. It tells us that by setting us up with Zacchaeus who wanted to see Jesus. Let me give you a, a theology of tax collectors. Especially if I then go out of the passage and start talking about other tax collectors all over the Bible, you see how the power is lost. You know, and, and what we see here is that Jesus is on purpose and that Jesus redirects anger and that Jesus, I can make all the same points, but it just feels like a bit of a flat lecture compared to the energy of telling the story, right? Now we've got to go to the other types of literature. So uh, as much as I'd love to stay there, I've got on page four, 10 pointers for preaching stories. Are you sure? Do we go to 11? 11.30, I think we go to. Isn't this session till 11.30? Good. <laughs> I'll ignore that completely. So 10 pointers for preaching story. Okay, I'm not going to go through those now, but that's basically what I've been saying. Tell the story. Experience it. Uh, be creative with it. Let's switch to discourse just for a, a really brief bit of time. Discourse, like an epistle section, is very different, although... It is a snapshot into a story. And once you start to feel the power of narrative, you'll start to realize, hang on a minute, that does apply in other areas. Paul to the Ephesians is a snapshot. It's a moment in time, but it's part of a bigger story that the book of Acts gives to us. And if you're careful, you can explore the significance of Trophimus being with Paul in Jerusalem, blamed for when Paul gets arrested and now several years later Paul's in prison writing to the Ephesian. Well, that story helps to understand, helps us to understand why Paul tells them, I am in chains for your sake and it's okay, don't feel bad about it. I want you to be reassured about it in chapter 3 of Ephesians. It, it's part of a story, but in the form in which it's written, it's kind of meticulous sentence after sentence with connectives and structure, and it's a very different type of literature. Okay, so how does it work? Well, the author's intended effect is, is on the surface. He's, he's saying what he wants to happen, or he's saying what he wants them to know. There's nothing really subtle about it. It tends to be right there. And so tone or mood or just direct statements should reveal to us what it is he's, he's trying to achieve. So as ever, we look at historical context, written context. We look at the uh, stuff that's going on around it and that historical situation. And then we get into the details. Now, if you look at that passage, Ephesians 1, 15 to 23, if we had the time, one of the, the ways that I would do this that could be helpful is to put the passage on the screen on a Word document, like you've got it on here, but just having it on the screen and saying, okay, what's going on in this passage? Because what we tend to see when we come to a passage like this, uh, fresh, the first time, is just a whole load of words, right? And we get overwhelmed with the words and it just feels like a massive amount of information. And if we don't know what we're doing, when we preach it, we'll just give people a massive amount of information and we'll get caught up in it. You know, so for example, for this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints. Oh, there's a lot there, isn't there? Let me tell you about faith in the Lord Jesus. What is faith? Uh, let me give you some examples of faith. What does faith achieve? Faith, of course, is the way, means by which we access uh, salvation. I can start getting into a systematic theology of faith. Um, I can go to love for all the saints. Jesus' great commandment was to love one another. 
all right, as you love yourselves. This is the follow-up to love the Lord your God. So by the way, if you love God, the flow that comes from that should need to love one another. How are we doing with loving one another? And we can get into this whole developed sermon about something that actually Paul would look at that and go, what are you doing? Why are you talking about faith and love? And all of that stuff you're saying is true, but keep going. I haven't made my point yet. And, and, and you keep going. Do not cease to give thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. Do we mention people in our... No, no, it's not good there. Um, that, the Lord, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. That's what he's actually praying for. And so what you're looking for in a passage is, is to break free of the temptation to just make something of everything and instead say, no, this is all feeding something. There's a main thought here. And I think the main thought is right there at the end of verse 17. He's praying to God to give to them knowledge of him. Not just knowledge, but real knowledge, heart-level knowledge of God, that intimate knowledge of Him. And then he develops that. And so what I would do with a Word document is I would probably underline that, I pray that, God will give you da 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 in the knowledge of Him. I try to highlight that. And then I say, look at what comes next, because instead of just a block of material, He now gives a list of items. There's three of them. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know, first item, what is the hope of his calling? Second item, so I'm, I'm creating a list now on the screen which is helping me to see the structure of the text. What is the hope of his calling? Number two, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And number three, what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? There's three points. That's actually quite nice as a preacher. I'd rather hear you talk about those three than an abstract theology of faith and love for saints because that was introductory. Do you see what I'm saying? You, you, as you spend time in the passage, you're wrestling with it. It's not saying everything. It's saying something. What is it saying? Paul is praying for them to really know God to know the hope of his calling, the riches of his inheritance in the saints, and to know his power, present tense, toward us who believe. And then what does he do? Because that's not the end of the passage. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. He's going on from that power thing. So on the screen, I just have to describe this, got the opening part here, and then you've got these three items the hope, the inheritance, the power. Boom, boom, boom. And then, for the rest of the passage, he's got a sub-list under the power. He's going to develop that power thought. And he's going to say, uh, do, 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 a working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand. Uh, da, 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 all the way through there. Uh, and put all things in subjection under his feet. Um, and gave him as head over all things to the church. So that's another list. Those are items that are parallel to each other. So his big prayer is that they would know God, specifically these three things. And if we want to know where the emphasis lies, it's in the third one, because that's the bit he develops with these four descriptions of that power. And so when I'm preaching that, instead of giving all sorts of details about every word in the passage, ultimately what I'm saying to people is what Paul is, is writing here, what we are seeing in this passage, is that there is strength for us to live. There is power for us to live the Christian life that God calls us to. The, the life that we're living now, with all of the struggles and all of the difficulties, and even all of the the sense of it's not possible that God can save me, really, because I'm really bad. Well, there's plenty of power. It's the same power that rose Jesus from the dead and exalted him and put everything under his feet and made him head over the church. So it's an amazing passage where the focus is on Christ with the implication, or not implication, with the point that that power is toward you. Trust him for it. 
Trust God for the power to live the life he's called you to. Verses, one, uh, verses 3 to 14. But you see, how I'm getting to that, and I'll use illustrations and, and different ways of clarifying that. I might use the language of a four-stage rocket booster because it's got this climbing sense, right? Rising from the dead and ascending into heaven and pushing everything down and lifting him up. Just to help people see that, I might say, okay, how much fuel is there available? Imagine a rocket that has these different stages, you know, burn one off and then burn the next one, then burn the next one. This is a powerful rocket. This is the most powerful. So I might use some completely bizarre illustration to make the point of the text, but how do I get there? I'm looking at the structure. I'm trying to figure out the flow of the argument. I'm looking at the words in details, not as random thoughts, but as to how they feed together. And so my, my message ultimately is a preaching of that passage. I may use language from outside or illustrations or stories or whatever, but I'm trying to get the message of that passage communicated. Okay, that's way too short. But I, I kind of think that if I'm going to go short on any of the Bible versions or the Bible types, literature types, discourse is going to be the one, okay? Because it's probably the most familiar uh, for us. But any quick questions on that? I made it sound easy, and it's not easy. It takes work. And for me, putting it in a Word document and moving things around can help me to see the structure of the passage. That's why I said that. So let's go to... Um, Poetry for the last little bit because poetry is alien to us. Even if you're into poetry in your language, Hebrew poetry is not the way your language does poetry. And so it takes a little bit of learning uh, to understand it. So where is it? We mentioned this Psalms, wisdom, literature, and prophets. There's a lot of it in the Bible. Um, let me walk, walk through these comments on page 7. Be aware of the main poetic forms. So if you read the, the commentaries, they'll talk about psalms of lament or psalms of praise or psalms of thanksgiving. But don't try to force a poem to fit some kind of framework. There was no framework that the, the Hebrew writers were kind of checking as they wrote their poems. What happened was their poems fell into some broad shapes and so don't try to make something do something it doesn't. If it goes out of order from what the commentary says it should do, don't worry about it. Enjoy what you've got. Secondly, take note of any historical indicators, but don't try to force a poem to fit in a historical situation that you've only guessed at. You see, if you're used to preaching epistles where you know that Paul was writing this in March of 61 AD, you know, to these people, and some of these people were named this and this and this. We've got incredible historical knowledge of New Testament materials. And then we go back to the Psalms, and all we see is of David. And so we try to do the same thing. Now, there are some places where it tells us, this is when David feigned madness in the presence of Abimelech. Okay, I can, I can place that. Or after committing adultery with Bathsheba, David, you know, okay, we know that situation. But often it just says, of David. And so, is this David the shepherd boy with his harp and the sheep and the stones? Is this David and, um, you know, being anointed as king but not yet king and playing the music for the king? Is this David killing Goliath? Is this David um, on the run from Saul? Is this David on the run from his own son? Is this David in a time of relative peace? Is this David in his old age where he was, you know, kind of cold in bed? We've got an awful lot of information about David. And if we say, mm, I think it's David here, and then we interpret the passage in light of that, that's circular. We don't know it was David here. So people talk about Psalm 131, I think it is, uh, where he's referencing things too wonderful for me. Ah, this must be after David became king. There's nothing in there to indicate that. But I see commentaries written based on the assumption that David is pondering his own throne position, his own majesty. I just think they then missed some of what's going on in that little psalm because they've made an assumption. 
So in a sense, we have to sort of release some of that historical desire that we have and say, no, let me just soak in this psalm. Let me feel what's there, because that's what poetry does. You don't have to know who wrote it and when they wrote it to be able to relate to the emotions that you find in poetry. Same in the prophets, interestingly, even though we get more information, sometimes we will not be able to place when they said it. But there's still value in reading it and making sense of it within a rough framework. Um, Note especially, number three, that Hebrew poetry is built using parallelism. Have you noticed that? Uh, The law of the Lord is perfect, comma, reviving the soul. It's, there's the second line completes the first line. And until you get into a rhythm of keeping those lines together, you'll be tempted to take half of a verse and make a point and miss the point. So let me see if I included it in here. Maybe, maybe not. Yes, down in page eight, uh, Proverbs twenty nine eighteen. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Full stop. No, there's no full stop there. And please, let's not use that one line as a biblical proof for vision statements. Okay, you see it all the time. Leadership books, first page, where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29, 18, A. That A means there's a problem. (laughs) And actually, I'll tell you what, Proverbs 29, 18, A, KJV, That's another indicator of a problem. When you have to use a certain version, you may well be misusing the Bible. Because it's, what's it saying? You've got to look at the second line. Where there is no vision, the people perish, but happy is he who keeps the law. The law keeping has something to do with the vision. No vision, people go crazy. But contrast, those who keep the law are happy. Keep that together. What's it referring to? It's not talking about vision statements. Our church has a vision statement, but we will never blame this verse for why we have one. Okay? So I'm not against vision statements. What I am against is misunderstanding Scripture, if we can possibly avoid it. What this is talking about is where there is no prophetic vision, where there is no revelation coming from God through the leadership to the people, the people will go crazy but those or the person who is responsive to the law or the revelation of God, that person is happy. This is not a verse for leadership network at ELF. This is a verse for Bible teachers network. When you stop teaching the Bible in your church, you're going to start seeing the results of that in the lives of your people. But when you preach the word, when you give the word of God to people, It brings blessing, it brings stability, it brings health. You see, that's how parallelism works. The second line completes the first and they need to be understood together. And so you go through and you've got these little building blocks all the way through and you also have kind of bigger structure and all the way through it's giving us images and the images uh, are there to be enjoyed and appreciated. So for five minutes right at the end, let's look at Psalm 113. I mentioned this yesterday with uh, the interview with John Piper. Um, Psalm 113. It, you'll notice the, the parallelism. Let me just read it to you. Notice, look for parallelism and for imagery. Okay, just really simple. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. There's parallelism. Okay, what are, they, what are the servants of the Lord supposed to praise? The name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. So always he should be praised. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. So from east to west, everywhere, or from beginning of the day to end of day, all day long, it could go either way, the Lord is to be praised. You're kind of getting the point of the Psalm already, right? He's praiseworthy. He should be praised by everyone, always, everywhere. Why? Verse 4, the Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who is seated on high? 
So it's the image is an enthronement image. It's the elevation. It's, it's lifting your, your eyes, your heart up to God on the throne. And he should be praised because he's there. No. Because he's there and yet he stoops down. It's the peculiarness of his majesty and his glory. It's the, uh, it's the unlikely because every, every king exalts themselves and goes higher, higher, higher. But the true king goes the opposite way. He stoops down. He looks far down on the heavens and the earth. I like the New American Standard here. I don't insist on it. But I think they get it right when they say, who humbles himself. That's in the Hebrew, the term is always used that way apart from this verse because it's slightly awkward for the translators of other Bibles to say God humbles himself. Shouldn't be if they're Bible readers, but you know, just a little comment there. It's, it's what it says. The high, exalted, enthroned, majestic God humbles himself for the little people on the earth. And then we get some images to reinforce that, some illustrations. He raises the poor from the dust. And he lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He goes to the lowest people and he lifts them up and honors them. He goes to the broken, verse 9, he gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Now that's two examples of how God stoops down and cares for the person that seems totally forgotten, totally lost. God cares for them. Now, as a preacher, by the way, as soon as I see the barren woman reference, I've got an alarm bell going because that, if I'm not careful, could really hurt. If there's a woman or two or three in my church who have never been able to have children and they prayed about it and they prayed about it and they prayed about it and it feels like God never did this for them, that's not going to give them the result that's intended of praising the Lord. So I somehow need to sensitively convey this. And actually, I think it's a reference back to Hannah and, and what happened with her and Samuel. And there's tie-ins to her song. And maybe by going there and with some sensitivity that, you know what, God doesn't promise to always do that. But there is something greater. God does absolutely stoop down in humility for all of us, even if we've never had certain things answered. So there needs to be a tenderness in how we preach it. But you see how the poem is just sitting up to be preached. And as you work your way through that text, you should be giving people a view of God that is so high. And the reason he is to be praised is not just that. That would be true of Allah. That would be true of any God. But what's unique about our God is that he humbles himself. And then it's up to you. You can leave that hanging as a, as a thought, or you can say, you know what, I'm going to make it really clear. How do we know that ultimately? Because of the cross. The whole trajectory of the Bible ultimately is that God came and died on the cross for people like us. So you can go there and make it explicit. You can hint at it, or you can just say, here we are in the Old Testament. And some of you think the God of the Old Testament is just high and exalted and aggressive and nasty. And that's, you're missing the point. Because when we see, uh, I'm going New Testament again. When we see Jesus, we're seeing a revelation of the true God, the Father, uh, Father, Son, Spirit. We see God revealed in Christ, but we see God here in the Old Testament as a self humbling God, the glory of his humility. This psalm should stir praise. It should make us go, wow, what a God. Who is there like our God? That's what this psalm's trying to achieve. And as you recognize the parallelisms, you recognize the structure, but most of all, you feel the images, you're able to then convey that to people, not like an epistle, point by point, but letting it soak, letting the images form, letting it marinate and become a part of, of people's worshipful response. So there you go. We've got narratives that preach differently to epistles and discourse, which preaches differently to poems. Lots of information. But next session, you're going to get to get yourself stuck into a passage and wrestle with how to form a message and how, what that feels like to, to be doing.